Hi. Today's lecture is going to be over bootstrapping, and this will correspond to lectures 3.3 and 3.4 in the Law 5 textbook. Bootstrapping is a technique that we can use to estimate the standard error of a sampling uh, distribution while only having access to a single sample. So we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> These are sort of the key concepts and some questions that I think you might want to think about while you're going through this lecture. Um, this, the main, the overarching question is sort of how can we estimate the variability of a sample statistic with just a single sample? And that is going to be the motivation for the bootstrap. And so you're going to want to ask yourself, well, what is a bootstrap sample? How did we create one? What did we assume about that original sample in order to create one? What is a bootstrap statistic? What is a bootstrap distribution? What's in it? How can we use it? Where is it centered? And finally, how can we use the bootstrap distribution to calculate a confidence interval? We're going to learn two techniques. Uh, the first one relies on the formula you've already used for calculating confidence intervals. And then the other one uses this method called the percentile method. And I would say that this is the preferred method in general. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we're going to uh, finish with a discussion about the effect of sample size on, um, on the standard error. So uh, the, basically, the only information that comes to us from 4.4 is this method about the percentile method. Otherwise, everything else is in 4.3. So let's begin with an example. So this is data on, from the 2012 Olympic men's marathon finishers, and this is their finishers time. So if you look in the upper left right here in this plot, this is a plot of all the men's uh, finisher times. And so I think there were approximately, or I think it was a total of 87 individuals that finished the marathon. And this is what their distribution of their times looks like. <clears throat> so, this is the population, which I'm hoping you would look at and you'd describe this as being somewhat, somewhat uh, right skewed. Below the population, imagine that for some reason we didn't have access to all 87 um, men's times. Now this example seems a little contrived because, well, this would be something where we could have the whole entire population. But just imagine instead of collecting data on all 87 men, we just recorded the times of 30 random men, right? And so this is their finishers times down here in this in this plot in the bottom, right? So this is the, the, the our random sample plot down here below. So we can see that it actually includes both the slowest and the men, uh, the fastest men, man who finished uh, the marathon. Um, and it seems to look somewhat similar to the population, but uh, not necessarily uh, would such a small sample do you expect it to look I exactly like the population. So what we could do is we could ca calculate the sample mean for that random sample. And then what we can do is we can plot it over. I'm sorry about that. Plot it over here in the plot on the right. So we calculate the mean, we put it in here, and then we're gonna take another random sample. We'll calculate the mean and we'll pl plot it in here. We'll repeat this process 10,000 times. And then we've effectively approximated our sampling distribution, right? So if, if this mean right here is, like right here is where that sample mean is, maybe that value then would be uh, over here in, in this line right here. Maybe that's where one of those dots would correspond to that mean. And then there'd be 999 other samples, uh, sample means that were taken, that were calculated based on 999 random samples of sample size 30 from the population right up here in the upper left. And so that's how we would create that sampling distribution. And so why do we want a sampling distribution? I hope the idea, that, I hope that you've learned that the reason we want a sampling distribution is we want to understand how much sample statistics vary from sample to sample and the sampling distribution allows us to calculate the standard error which is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution <clears throat> so if we're given the information like uh what this the uh, sample mean is and what the standard error is 
And let's just say because we were using a random sample of 30 from before, our, our sample size is 30. This might be information you might see in a problem. Um, so what we might be asked to do is to construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the average 2020 Olympic men's marathon finishers time. So how would we calculate this? Well, hopefully you remember it's a sample statistic. Plus or minus two times the standard error. So it'll be the sample statistic plus or minus two times 1.14 It'll be 1.4122. Oh, let me just skip this. If you expand that out, that's going to equal 138.94 and 143.50. And the, our sample statistic is our X bar up there, just in case that wasn't clear. So how would we interpret this? We would say we are... 95% confident that the average 2020 Olympic men's mar marathon finishers time is between 138.94 and 143.50. <clears throat> Note that this unit is in minutes too. So we probably should just to be complete, we should write minutes. So we are 95% confident that the average 2012 Olympic men's marathon finishers time is between 138.94 and 143.5 minutes. That's our interpretation, and we calculated it up here. Now, this could be information that we would have gotten from this sample right here. So this sample mean would have been 141.22, and then we would have had that standard error. Now, you may be asking yourself right now, well, where does this standard error come from? How do we get that standard error? Now. The standard error we could get from the sampling distribution, right? The standard error is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So what we could do is we could simulate it by taking random samples of size 30 from our population, calculating our mean, and then plotting it, right? And then we've, then we've simulated our sampling distribution that's shown here on the right. From that, then, maybe we calculate that, you know, this is our... This is our standard, our standard error. Like it's like this long, you know, because I don't remember what that value was. It's uh, 1.14, so maybe this is 1.14. That's a standard deviation, and so that's our, that's our standard error. <clears throat> now, what's the problem with this? Well, the problem with this is this. Oh, um, hang on. Uh, I'll I'll talk about it momentarily, um, but let me just recap is what I'd like to do before I do this, just so that you understand how this process works. So how do we simulate a sampling distribution? First and foremost, we need to have access to our entire population. So in the case of the example I just showed you, the Olympic 2012 men's marathon finishers times, we had access to all 87 men's times, okay? That's how we simulate a, a sampling distribution. Then what we do is we're gonna take a random sample of size n, and so in this past situation, we allowed n to equal 30. We're going to compute our statistic of interest. For example, a mean or a proportion. In this case, it was the average men's finishing times. So that was a mean. You can also do this for a difference in proportions or a difference in means or a correlation, um, as well as other statistics. You're going to repeat steps 2 and 3, say 10,000 times. You're always going to do these steps. Whenever you're doing simulations, you're always going to do it a lot. So we're always going to do it at least 10,000 times. And then what you're going to do is you're going to collect those statistics that you calculated um, in uh, step three that you repeated 10,000 times. And you're going to use that to approximate the sampling distribution like what we did here. So this is an approximation. So this has only got 1,000 sample means in it, but that's because I couldn't easily show 10,000. 
Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to allow that standard deviation of that sampling distribution to be our estimate of the standard error. So this is really just a recap of what I said previously. But if we have the population, we don't need to calculate a standard error. We don't need an interval estimate because we know what the parameter of interest is, right? So if I were to go back to this beginning here, if I had access to my population, if I had access to this whole thing, I can just calculate the average men's finisher time in 2012 and that is going to be my parameter of interest. That is mu. So there's no reason to calculate an X bar and then to say, well, the, but my sample mean is my best estimate of my population mean, or I can create an interval estimate to get a, a range of plausible values for my population mean. Well, if we have access to our population, we don't need to do any of that stuff. We just calculate the parameter of interest, which is mu. So that's kind of a problem. Okay. But what about the situation where we don't have our population? What do we do in that situation? How do we calculate our standard error? Now, just as a reminder, our sample statistic represents our, our um, best estimate of our population parameter. It also represents a point estimate of our population parameter. And that what we're interested in, though, is not just coming up with a single value. We would like to know a range of plausible values for that population parameter. And that's why we're going to be doing things like calculating confidence intervals. In order to calculate a confidence interval, we need a standard error, right? This formula for calculating a confidence interval is our sample statistic plus or minus two times the standard error. So we need that standard error. Now, how do we get a standard error if we have just a single sample? And we don't know our population. So what I have in this dot plot here is a random sample of 40 mammals. And this is their lifespan data. So this is the average lifespan of all 40 mammals. You can see that it ranges from just a little bit ab uh, above zero up into 40 years old. So they range ac across this, this um, about 40 years. Um, and we want to use this to calculate the average lifespan of all mammals. So we want to use, we want to, basically find out what mu is, right? We want mu for all mammals. What we're gonna get here is X bar, okay? But what we want to do is figure out a way to come up with a measure of the variability in our X bars, but using just this single sample. Now, if you remember, what we did when we do our sampling distribution, our simulator sampling distribution, is that we take a random sample from our population of the same sample size. So maybe we could do that here. So let's take a random sample of our original sample, which is shown on the top. And then this is our new sample on the bottom. So effectively, we're going to treat our original sample as though it's the population. But it's the population in italics, okay? It's not the real population. We're just going to treat it as though it's the population. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a random sample of the same sample size from that original population to create this new sample. Hmm. There appears to be a problem here, right? Hopefully you're looking at these two plots and you're like, Chris, if I take a if I take a random sample of size 40 from a sample that only had a sample size of 40, I'm going to get back the exact same shape, the exact same cases and units. And that is going to be a problem because I'm going to get no variability. And that's exactly right. If you look here, you see that those are the same things. So this is if you took a random sample with something known as without re replacement, which I think is generally how we think about this. Now imagine you have a, a hat, okay? <clears throat> and you throw in the numbers one through 40 into that hat on pieces of paper. And what you wanna do is you wanna take a random sample of 40 from that hat, okay? 
So you go through, you pull out maybe number three comes first, then number 27, then number four. You keep going until you do this as 40, uh, until you get all 40 uh, names out of the hat. Now, if you do this and there's only 40 numbers in that hat, I meant numbers, not names earlier. If you have 40 numbers in that hat, then you're going to just draw out that same 40 numbers. But what happens if after I draw the number three, what if I put it back into the hat? What happens after I, if I were to draw the number 25 and put the number back in the hat? Well, the thing is then, number three and number 25, those values that corresponding to those numbers, they could be repeated again and again. And that's the idea behind, ran, behind taking a sample with replacement. So again here, we've got our original sample on the top, which we're gonna consider our population. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a random sample of size 40 with replacement. And that's going to be what we're seeing down here in the bottom. So imagine that this guy over here, or this guy, it's a, it's a, it's a, a an animal and this animal over here, um, let's say I throw that animal into my hat as well as all these other animals. I throw numbers that correspond to their, their values of their longevity. Now, if you look down in the plot below, you see that that, uh, that case was drawn twice. So that would be analogous to me drawing this, this number out of the hat and then putting it back into the hat, and then that number was drawn again. You can see here as well that if you look here, this individual was drawn a lot. Looks like they were drawn in, out of that hat almost seven times or seven times. This end of th there's two that correspond to right here, but there's three that correspond right here. So that means one of those cases, or maybe uh, maybe um, uh, one of those cases was was repeated at least once. It could have been repeated three times, I mean uh, two times more after being drawn. And so you'll see that because of the fact that we're doing a sampling with replacement, now we're able to actually introduce variability into our samples. So. Let's draw four more bootstrap samples. Bootstrap samples, what's that? That's what this is called when we're doing this sampling with replacement of the same sample size from our original sample. These, these are what are called bootstraps. So this, this one up here, this number one, is the one you just saw here. Well, then we draw a second one, and we draw a third one, and we draw a fourth one. And we see they all have different shapes and they all have different values in their samples, which means X bar of one, X bar of two, X bar of three, and X bar of four will not all be equal. There will be variability between these. So we don't expect them to all be equal, which is great. So then now we've got these four bootstrap samples. What we wanna do is we wanna calculate the sample mean of bootstrap sample one. We want to calculate the sample mean of bootstrap two. We want to calculate that mean of bootstrap sample three. We want to calculate the mean of bootstrap sample four. And that's what we do. And we're going to plot it right here. And this is going to form the basis of what's called a bootstrap distribution. So a bootstrap distribution is going to contain bootstrap statistics. In this case, these are bootstrap means. And these are the means from, from those four samples before. Uh, I don't necessarily know which one corresponds to which, um, but these are the four means that correspond to these four plots. So this is a bootstrap distribution created just based off of four samples, where we're plotting just four sample means. But whenever we're doing simulation, I said we should always do it like 10,000 times. And that's what we do in the next plot here. So this is what our bootstrap distribution looks like if we repeat the process of taking a random sample with replacement of size 40, calculate the sample mean of that bootstrap sample, save that mean, and repeat that process uh, 9,999 more times, and then we plot all of them here. So if you look at this, I wonder how you might describe this the shape of this distribution. I'm hoping you're looking at this and you're like, wow, oh, looks kind of 
looks kind of bell-shaped and it does it looks indeed it does look bell-shaped and bootstrap distributions for most of the statistics that we're going to consider in this class are going to be bootstrap are going to be um, symmetric just like the sampling distributions which is really good it's a really good statistical property so we've now created a bootstrap distribution okay this is great but has that actually helped us figure out what to do yet well in our bootstrap distribution we do have a standard deviation and that standard deviation is 1.12 maybe we could use that as our estimate for our standard error and that is exactly what we're going to do we're going to use the bootstrap distribution standard deviation as our estimate for our standard error okay and what we're going to do is we're going to construct and interpret a 95 percent confidence interval for the average lifespan of all mammals using the standard deviation from the bootstrap distribution so if we recall the sample statistic plus or minus two times the standard error our sample statistic is x bar plus or minus two times the standard error that's 13 0.15 plus or minus 2 times 1.15 uh, 1.12 excuse me and that's going to equal 10.91 to 15.39 <clears throat> so we can say we are 95 percent confident that the average lifespan for all mammals ranges between 10.91 and 15.39 years Hopefully that interpretation makes sense. Uh, it's the same interpretation we've been giving these things over and over again. Uh, one thing I want you to note is our original sample mean was 13.15. Our bootstrap distribution mean is 13.15. What that means is our bootstrap mean, I mean our bootstrap distribution is centered at the sample mean. or the sample proportion, or the sample difference in mean, it's going to be centered at our sample statistic. And in that case, in this case, it happened to be a mean. Well, let's think about that for a moment conceptually. Why does that make sense? If we go back a few slides, I told you that we want to consider our original sample as being our population. Well, what do we know about a sampling distribution? Well, we know that the sampling distribution, that, the, that it is centered at the population parameter, in this case, the population mean. So if we treat our original sample, in a sense, as though it's the population, in quotation marks, it makes intuitive sense that it should be centered at the sample statistic, because in a sense, we're treating that sample statistic as its, quote unquote, the parameter. So it makes sense then why uh, that would that would be the case. Now, this may all seem kind of crazy to you. Like you're like, whoa, how can you do this? You have one sample, and from one sample you've created ten thousand samples. And hopefully, from looking in your textbook where they have this really nice diagram of these different people um, and the ones that end up in your sample. You, you get the sense that, uh, that what really is the most critical piece for this to work is that we need a random sample. So there's this figure, I, I forget um, what page it's on, but it's a figure with some people like in some different drawings and illustrations. But it talks about like the most critical piece is the fact that we need a random sample. So we need this random sample. If we don't have a random sample, Oops. Without a random sample, that means that our sample is not representative of our population. A random sample ensures that our, our uh, sample is representative of our population. That is a critical piece for doing this and constructing the bootstrap distribution. If, for some reason, we were to come back here, right, and we were to say, actually, this is not a random sample of 40 mammals. This is a 
particular sample. It's a convenience sample. There's something about these mammals. Well, that means they're not representative of all mammals, which means we can't treat the sample like it's like the population. And that's the random sample piece. We need the random sample. Random sampling ensures that our sample is representative of our population. And if our sample is indeed representative of our population, it makes sense to sort of treat it and conceptually think about it as a population, which is what we do when we're doing the bootstrap. Hopefully that makes sense to you. So, and just because I've, I've mentioned this figure, I do want to quickly tell you where it is. It is on, it is on page 3.14. It's figure 3.14. It's their little sketch of uh, people where they talk about sampling with replacement. <clears throat> so I would, I would encourage you to just take a peek at that because I feel like that is quite helpful for understanding. So we have our original sample now. Then what do we do? We take a random sample of size n with replacement from the original sample. In this case, n equals 40. We're going to take a random sample of size 40 with replacement from the original sample. That's called our bootstrap sample. We're going to compute our statistic of interest for each bootstrap sample, and we're going to and that's going to be called a bootstrap statistic. We're going to collect all of those statistics from at least 10,000 samples, and we're going to create our bootstrap distribution. That's how we generate our bootstrap distribution. Then what we're going to do is we're going to estimate the standard error by calculating the standard deviation from the bootstrap distribution. So once we get to this point, it's pretty straightforward. So there are two methods for calculating the 95% confidence interval. There's this first method, which is the sample statistic plus or minus two times the standard error. That's the formula that we've been using so far, where you can allow that standard error to equal the standard deviation of the bootstrap distribution. The alternative approach is to use percentile methods. So we know that the 95% confidence interval should capture the middle 95% of the data. So what that means we need to do is we need to locate the 2.5 percentile and the 97.5 percentile. So we're going to basically identify where those two percentiles are in our bootstrap distribution. And then we're going to use those for our lower limit and our upper limit of our 95% confidence interval. Now, you may be wondering, well, which approach is the better approach? When the bootstrap distribution is reasonably bell-shaped and symmetric, these two approaches will be reasonably close. So in that situation, it really doesn't matter which approach you use. Um, however, I would suggest that the percentile method is a more robust method and a better method, as well as a more flexible one, because you could calculate an 85%, a 90%, or a 99% confidence interval if you wanted to. If you wanted to do a 90% confidence interval, all you need to do is calculate the, find the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile, because in the middle, there's going to be 90%. For the uh, 99th percentile, it's the same thing. You're going to calculate the bottom half a percent and the upper 99.5th percent. And then in the middle there, there's going to be 99. So we learn about 95% confidence intervals, but sometimes you don't necessarily care to have a 95% confidence interval. You'd rather have another type of confidence interval. And so using this percentile method, you can just go in there and identify the percentiles that match that desired confidence interval. The only requirement for the percentile method is that your bootstrap distribution is symmetric. It doesn't need to be bell-shaped. Uh, and if the bootstrap distribution is not symmetric, it's not appropriate to use a bootstrap distribution to find a confidence interval. Hopefully this makes sense to you. You may be wondering, well, when would I use a confidence interval that isn't a 95% confidence interval? Because that's the one that we're learning. Um, in some cases, we want to be more confident about where the, pro uh, the population parameter is. Uh, in some cases, we are uh, more comfortable with not being as confident about it. So in medicine, you often want to be very sure of where that population parameter lies if you're doing public health research or do work on a clinical trial. And so in those situations, you do want a wider confidence interval. And this will relate later on to something we're going to talk about uh, called hypothesis testing. Uh, but 
for for the moment now you just need to know that you can calculate different uh, confidence intervals based on the percentiles. So now what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to take a quick demo using stat key and we're going to look at pH in Florida lakes. So how do we do this? So I, I've, I've gone through and I've done the bootstrapping, but how do you actually do the bootstrap? To do the bootstrap for this case, uh, what we need to do is we need to identify the data. Uh, and we need to identify essentially what it is these, the parameter is that we want to look at. So for the pH in Florida lakes, we have a random sample of 53 lakes, and we want to know what is the average pH in uh, these Florida lakes. So we're basically going to be working with this middle column here. We want to do a bootstrap confidence interval, and we want to know the average pH. So that's going to mean we're going to look for the CI for a single mean. And so we're going to click that. And so conveniently, this particular data set is already loaded in stat key. If you click this box up here, you'll see that there is a Florida Lakes pH. Now, if you look in this graph in the upper right, this is our original sample. We see that there's a sample size of 53, that the mean is 6.591, that the median is 68, the standard deviation is 1.288, and that you can see in this dot plot, you can see these 53 dots that correspond to each of the values of pH that were observed. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a bootstrap distribution based off of this. The plot below the original sample is going to show our bootstrap sample. The plot to the right, the big, I mean to the left, the big plot to the left is going to be our bootstrap distribution. So first we'll generate one sample and we'll see our first bootstrap sample shown right here in the lower uh, right. Uh, we can see that there were some values that were obtained multiple times and there were some values that didn't show up at all. Like we see that there's this one lake that had a really low pH in the original sample and that never occurred in our bootstrap sample. So we, we calculate our sample mean, our bootstrap sample mean there, and then we're going to plot that into our bootstrap distribution. So we see that that was 6.606. We're going to repeat this one more time. We see that this mean now is 6.68 uh, for our new bootstrap sample, and that that value gets plotted right in here. It's this value right here. <clears throat> and we see that the, the bootstrap distribution gives us a running to uh, tally of what the mean is. So the mean of these two points is 6.637. We repeat this again. We get a new bootstrap sample. We get a new bootstrap statistic added to our plot. We'll repeat it again and again, and again, and again, and again. And so you'll see we're continuing to do this. We'll do this two more times. And then now what we've done is we have a bootstrap distribution of, of 10 bootstrap sample means. But I told you we want to do this for at least 10,000. So we're going to click the generate uh, 1,000 samples, and we're going to do that 10 times. So 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so uh, just to before we look at the shape and we talk about that, you'll see that it says in the upper right it says samples equals um, ten thousand and ten. So we have ten thousand and ten bootstrap sample means in here. So these are all these are all sample average pHs because our data set is the pH of Florida lakes. We see that the mean of this is 5.689. And we see that the mean of the original sample was 5. Point, I mean, sorry, not 5, 6.591. So those two means are very close to one another. And we see that our standard error was estimated at 0.174. So what, if we wanted to here, we could now calculate a confidence interval based off of that standard error. What we would do is we would do the sample statistic plus or minus that two times that standard error if we wanted to create a 95% confidence interval. So that would be 6.591 plus or minus 2 times 0.174. Note I used 6.591 and not 6.589.
The 6.589 is the mean of the bootstrap distribution. It's not our original sample statistic. Our original sample statistic was 6.591. So that's if we wanted to use the formula base. But we have our entire bootstrap distribution. So let's just go ahead and use the percentile method. To do that, we'll click two tails. And by default, what it does is it cuts off the lower 2.5% tail and the upper 2.5% tail. And you can see that in the middle, it says 0 0.950. That's going to tell you that that's the middle 95%. So the values that are at the very bottom, the value 6.245 and the value 6.921, those are the values that will correspond to our 95% confidence interval. So in this situation, we could say we are 95% confident that the average pH for all Florida lakes is between 6.245 and 6.921. Now I said we could create other percentiles and it's very easy to. We don't have to just use a confidence level of 95. If we wanted to use a confidence level of 80, we could click this 0.95 and we could just type the value 0 0.80 and click OK. And then now we have a 80% confidence interval. And we would interpret this by saying we are 80% confident that the average pH for all Florida lakes is between 6.384 and 6.808. So you'll notice that when we have a smaller confidence interval, I mean a smaller confidence level, that our confidence interval shrinks. If we were to go out and change this to say 0.99 to create a 99% confidence interval, you see that those values have now gotten bigger, right? They're now at 6.132 and 7. Uh, 0, 047. So when you increase the confidence uh, level, you're also going to increase the uh, when you increase the confidence level, you're going to increase uh, the width of your confidence interval. Blah. That's a bit of a mouthful, but hopefully that makes sense to you. And we're going to be using stat key in class, so you're going to get experience using this to uh, to do this. And so. We've, we're able to not, we don't have to use the formula here. We don't have to use that standard error. We can use the bootstrap distribution directly. Okay. Oops. So we come back. So the other thing that is important to note, and it's kind of, this is a, a bit of a different thing just because uh, in general, we only have a single sample, right? But when you're in the planning stage, one of the things you want to do is you want to plan, well, how large of a sample size do I need? And what impact then is the sample size going to have on our confidence interval? Well, the larger your sample size, it tends to increase the estimate of your population parameter. Therefore, if your sample size is larger, your standard error will get smaller, which means that your confidence interval will get smaller. Okay, I hope everybody under uh, I hope everybody is able to better understand bootstrapping after this lecture, and un and better able to understand confidence intervals because this is the one of two important pieces that go into inferential statistics. The other one being hypothesis testing, which we'll start on uh, next week. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email or I will see you in class and you can ask them. I hope everybody has a great day.